Hello everyone, we're going to talk about the sampling. This is chapter 7. So we have the following problem. We want to estimate some parameter theta from the distribution of random able and we have some data at hand. Okay. Uh, the, the thing is that we know the underlying so we, we know the probability density or probability mass function of the underlying data, but we don't know the parameters of of the density or the probability density function or probability mass function. And what we want to do is we want to estimate these parameters using the data at hand. Maybe I have to give a simple and stupid example. So assume we have some stupid question. We are interested in mean GPA of ADA students. Okay. So the totality of all objects, all entities that is interesting for me is basically all ADA students. So basically this question here, to answer this question here, to find a mean CGP of ADA students, I have to know, ideally I have to know the CGP of all students studying at ADA. And that is really a burdensome task to carry out, isn't it? Because you have many students studying at ADA. Right. In this particular example, I mean, this population obviously has some characteristics like uh, its mean, its variance, and so on and so forth. But we are interested in the mean in this particular example, but you may be, may well be interested in other characteristics. So now let's, let's focus on the mean only in this particular example because this is our research question to find the mean CGP of ADA students. So what do we do in this kind of situation where collection of data from population, I mean collecting information about each and every entity within population is costly or is not possible at all. So the statistics I mean, statistics is, is offering you a recipe. It tells you that if you cannot collect information about everybody in the population, just take a fraction of individuals within that population, call it sample, and that sample should be randomly picked, or alternatively, you should say that the axis and the, the students' CGPAs within the sample, they are IID, independently and identically distributed. So you are selecting the first student, the first student's CGPA is independent, I mean the second student's CGPA is independent of the first one and uh, so on and so forth. So basically, if you got the first student's CGPA equal to three, it does not help you to predict in any way the second student's CGPA. So this is basically independence and identicity means that each and every random variable here, you see this CGPAs, they are random variables and we assume that all these random variables from X1 to Xn, they possess the same probability density function. Okay, although we don't know that probability density function. So that is the IID assumption. Or alternatively put, this is the assumption about the randomness of the samples. We always try to make sure that samples are random. Probably this IID is more precise and uh, stronger assumption than just saying that samples should be random. Anyway, so the, the statistics recipe about this situation when it's difficult to collect information about everybody in the population is 
to take a fraction of individuals within population, you know, which, which, which is basically um, sample, and then calculate the mean of sample, let me call it xi over n. So this sample mean is going to be your best guess that you can form about the unknown population mean. Why is that your why is the sample mean is a good guess of the unknown population mean is another topic, we'll talk about that. So now in this case, this guy here is the, the x bar here is nothing but a function, right? A function which is applied onto the sample data. I mean, we may not have the sample we may not actually draw the sample, but we know the formula for the sample mean, isn't it? So the sample mean is a function that is going to be applied to the sample data. So this function is called an estimator. The function itself is an estimator, okay? Or you can call it as statistic, sample statistic, okay? Now what happens if you actually take sample and apply this function, this estimator onto the sample data, then you receive what is called an estimate, okay? When you are applying this function, let's say, when you are applying this mean function on some S, That is called an estimate. Or maybe I should say that Xn, capital Xn is an estimator, but lowercase xn is a realized value of the estimator when we take actual sample and apply this function. So let's call it an estimate. We have to be careful. The mean here is the mean, the population mean. This is a parameter. All characteristics, all summary statistics, so all, all uh, you know, descriptive measures. I would say all descriptive measures, whether it is mean variance, minimum, maximum, whatever it is. If that is referring to the population, then we call that as Parameter. So parameter is some characteristic of the population. It may be mean, its mean, its variance, and so on and so forth. And in each case, while dealing with statistical investigation, we may be interested in one or several characteristics, one or several parameters of the population. Meanwhile, the estimator is, or statistic, is the function that we apply to the sample data to form our best guess about the respective unknown parameter. And the realized value of the estimator is called an estimate, okay? Sometimes we refer to it as a point estimate, okay? Point estimate because this is a single value. Also, this guy is called the function. The estimator sometimes is referred to as point estimator because it gives you the result of this function, the, the output of this function is a single value. I hope it makes these definitions clear. So you can check it here. We say that random variables x1, xn consider a random sample on a random variable x if they are independent and each has the same distribution as x. Okay? So I think we have already talked about it. Statistic as I have mentioned, it is basically a function t that you apply onto the sample data, okay? And that is called a statistic or a point estimator. 
Again, an estimator is a function of the sample, while an estimate is the realized value of an estimator. Okay, uh, this is the same thing as saying that the estimator is a random variable, whereas an estimate is a particular realized value of the estimator. Okay. So statistic, they are actually summaries of the data. Actually statistics, yeah, exactly. They are usually some summaries of the data such as mean, variance, standard deviations, so on and so forth, okay? So now let's have a look at those summary measures, some of them, obviously. We have sample mean, which is usually in this way, it is denoted by x bar. x bar is nothing but the arithmetic average of the sample data points. Sample variance is calculated using this formula. And then we have a theorem which tells you that if you have a random sample and if you have normal distribution, Okay, then n minus 1 divided by sigma squared times the sample variance is going to be chi squared distributed with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. We are going to use this theorem to construct confidence interval for the unknown population variance. And sample covariance is estimated using this function. Okay, now let's move on. So we have to mention that you may have many estimators. Okay, in this example here, we estimate the unknown population mean, yes, the mean CGP of ADA students. That is interesting for us using the sample mean, using this particular formula, using this particular function or this particular point estimator, but you may come up with another estimator. You may say that, no, I, uh, no, I think that a good way to estimate the unknown population mean is just to take the sum of all sample data points and dividing by n over 2, for example. You may, you may come up with this estimator, right? And somebody else may come up with another function and may claim that that function, that estimator, is better than the other one. So how do we evaluate the goodness of a particular estimator, the advantage of or the superiority of one estimator over the other estimator? This is done using two rationale. One is called unbiasedness and the second called consistency. So when we say unbiasedness, we mean the estimator is correct on average. So this is very rough definition. So unbiasedness means to be correct on average. So basically, you're saying that if you take many, many samples from the population and find the, uh, you know, and, and, and perform estimation, and then if you find the mean of all estimates, then you are going to end up at the true value of the parameter, okay? Theta is parameter. It refers to the population, don't forget. 
And when we talk about consistency, we mean that as the sample size grows to infinity, you are going to reach, you are going to converge to the true value of the parameter in probability. Okay. So if you remember, according to the law of large numbers, we, we basically proved that prove the result, which was called the weak law of large numbers, we said that x bar n, which is the sample average that is approaching to this converging to the true mean, population mean, in probability. Okay? So, this is basically the definition of consistency. We can say that the sample mean x bar n is a consistent estimator of the population mean. Okay, so you may come up with another estimator of the population mean which may not be consistent. Okay, so that is one of the rational that we use, one of the metrics that we use to evaluate which estimator is good and which estimator is not. The second one is unbiasedness. So basically, it tells you that if you take many, many samples and find the estimate from each sample, and then if you take the average of the estimate from all those samples, you are going to end up at the true value of the unknown population parameter. Okay, so usually unbiasedness, unbiasedness is a stronger condition compared to consistency. And in most cases, except one that we are not going to cover in this course, so unbiasedness in most cases implies the consistency. So once you have an unbiased estimator that is going to be a consistent estimator too, but not vice versa. So the reverse is not correct. Keep that in mind. Now we have talked about estimates and estimators, point estimators. Remember estimates can be of two kinds. One of them is, and obviously estimators can, can be of two kinds. One is called point estimate, point estimates. And the second one is called interval estimate. Okay, or point estimator and interval estimator. Up to this point, we have talked about point estimators or point estimates. For example, sample mean is point estimator. The realized value of the sample mean is your point estimate. Why we call them point estimate or point estimator? Because they give us a single value. Okay, that is obvious. Sometimes we prefer using, or we prefer coming up with an interval estimate. And what is an interval estimate? Basically, you are coming up with lower bound and upper bound of the true parameter with some probability. For example, look at this equation here. This is the confidence interval, gamma percent confidence interval for the unknown population parameter theta. And we say that with gamma percent probability theta, the true population parameter theta is going to be between u of x and v of x. Okay, that is what an interval estimate estimate is. Okay. So now let's look at several examples. So example one, we have to come up with a 
lower bound and upper bound for the unknown parameter theta, such that the probability that the unknown parameter theta falls within this interval is equal to 95%. But here, we know that x bar minus theta times square root of n is actually normally distributed with mean 0 and with variance 1, with variance sigma square, I'm sorry. Okay? So pay attention to one fact. By definition, x is normal with mean theta and with variance sigma square, right? So this basically tells you that x bar minus theta will be exactly normally distributed because x bar minus theta is nothing but a linear combination of normal variables and linear combination of normal variables is exactly normal. So we don't really put this D letter here, which stands for convergence and distribution. So here we don't have convergence, but we have like exact, exact distribution of these random variables, not asymptotic distribution. Just be careful. The reason we have exact distribution because we already know the axis distribution. We know that each x is normal. And if you have linear combination of normal variables, you would have an exact normal distribution. Anyway, so we are searching for this guy, right, for the boundaries actually, but the problem is that this theta is is some constant, right? This is this is an unknown constant. So what can we do? We can reformulate this. We can say that we know that x bar minus theta. divided by sigma over square root of n, that is normal with mean 0 and variance 1, and let's call it a z variable, okay? And we know that the probability of z, now it's easy to work with z, it, we know that the probability that it will be between the z will be Let's call it z of 0 0.975 and z of 0 0.025 is equal to 0 0.95. So here, z of 0 0.025, that corresponds to quantile of z distribution such that probability of z being less than or equal to z 0 0.025 is actually equal to 0 0.025. So this is basically the inverse function of CDF. So this is, if this is CDF of normal distribution, maybe I had to use phi. If this is CDF of normal distribution, then quantile is nothing but the inverse of the CDF evaluated at 2.5%. So that gives you Z of 0. Okay, so by the same token, you can say that z of 97.5% is basically the inverse of CDF evaluated at 97.5%. Okay, good. But because normal distribution is symmetric, we know that this standard normal distribution is symmetric, we know that z of 0.025 is going to be equal to negative of z 0.975, okay, because of symmetricity of normal distribution. In some other distributions, this may not hold, so just be careful with it, okay? Anyway, 
So we got this thing, okay, and we know this. Um, we know these values actually. This is, if you look at the z distribution, we know that this is 1.96 and 1. Point, minus 1.96. Okay. So now we can plug for value of z. We know that z is nothing but this guy. You know, I have to change the color. So we can say that this probability is the same thing as p of minus 1.96 less than x bar minus theta over sigma over square root of n less than 1.96 and that should be equal to 0 0.95 right and here we can manipulate with with this inequality to make sure that theta is left alone within the center. See, we want to receive, we want to have theta in the center sandwiched with these two random boundaries, okay? So that is basically easy. We can basically put, you know, if, if you manipulate, just, you can say that, you see, I will multiply each side by sigma over square root of n, right? Then I receive x bar minus theta, and here I receive 1.96 times sigma over square root of n. That is going to be 0 0.95, good. And then what I can do, if I want to leave theta alone in the center, I can basically add x bar to each side of this inequality, then that's all. So I can say that probability of x bar minus 1.96 times sigma over square root of n. Just a second. Okay. It's, you see, Hmm. So it's going to be less than theta, the unknown parameter value, but be, be attentive because this theta is a fixed value. It is not a random variable, but the boundaries are random variables. And this is going to be less than x bar plus 1.96 times sigma over square root of n, and that is going to be equal to 0 0.95. Okay. So this is basically the confidence interval for the unknown parameter theta, okay? So 95% confidence interval for theta is basically x bar minus 1.96 times x bar plus minus 1.96 times sigma over square root of n. If you have and exact values of x bar, n and sigma, you just plug it and you will receive lower and upper bound. So this bound, this part and this part will be received. Remember again, theta is a parameter of the population that is unknown, that is a constant value. Meanwhile, u x and v of x, they are random variables. So we are basically trying to sandwich the unknown parameter theta between two random boundaries such that the probability that theta will fall within this, you know, uh, interval is equal to 95%. Okay, now let's move to um, the next things. What we got here, we have reminder on student uh, student's t distribution. So if you have a normal, standard normal distribution z, and if you divide it by some by the square root of the chi square and the variable, then that is going to be t distributed with n minus one degrees of freedom. Okay, and there is another uh, theorem. It tells you that if you have sample mean x bar, x bar minus mu over sample standard deviation over square root of n, which is basically, you see, this guy here is nothing but a chi-square random variable. 
see. Um, chi square random variable divided by n and under the square root of um, square root of square root operation. Okay, so if this is the case, then the whole thing is obviously going to be t distributed with n minus one degrees of freedom. Now let's look at one example. Confidence interval with sampling from the normal distribution where the variance is unknown. Remember, when the variance is unknown, it means that we are going to estimate that. And our estimate is a random variable because that is computed using the sample data. And in that scenario, it is obviously going to be t distributed. Okay, so the the ratio, this this ratio, is going to be t distributed because we have standard normal variable divided by the chi square random variable. Okay, let's look at that. Okay, we have x, which is normal, with mean theta with variance sigma square. Sigma square is known. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Neither sigma square nor theta is known. I believe we will estimate sigma square, although we don't have either theta or sigma square, but we are going to estimate theta. Uh, we're going to estimate sigma square through the sample variance, and sample variance formula is given here. Okay. And we have to make, we have to establish 95% confidence interval for theta. So nothing changes here. Basically, the, the idea is the same. It is still going to be x bar plus minus, you see, I will not explain it in this elaborate way. So I will just give the formula. So whenever you have, whenever you know that you have T distribution, the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval in this case is going to be equal to X bar plus minus. So let me write it like this. So the lower bound is going to be x bar minus t corresponding to 2.5% quantile with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And the upper bound will be x bar plus t value, t quantile corresponding to 0.975 with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And I forgot to multiply by by s, which is sample standard deviation, and divide by square root of n. The same should be here. Multiply by <coughs> sample standard deviation, divide by square root of n. So this is the lower bound, and this is the upper bound. Maybe I have to write it in. I'm writing it in a shorthand way. I say that this is basically equal to plus minus t of 0.975 and minus 1 times sample variance, sample standard deviation over n, the square root of n. I remember that because t is symmetric distribution as the normal as the standard normal distribution is. So T of 0.975 n minus 1 is going to be the same thing as minus T of 0.025 n minus 1. Okay. So now let's use that formula. We know that n is equal to 21 and nothing else is given here. So the only thing is, the only thing that is going to change is this. So you're going to say that just going to replace for t, so t is given, and n is given. n is given to be so 
So n is equal to 21. And what we have to find is t 0 0.975 corresponding to n minus 1, which is 20. We can search for that from the table, from the t table. So let me do that. Here I have. So we already have. I already have the table here. So degrees of freedom is 20, and quantile is, uh, I mean, the quantile that I'm searching for is T0.795, so it corresponds to this column and to this row. It is basically 2.086. Okay, 2.086. Okay, so using this, I can say that the confidence interval is going to be equal to x bar, which I don't know, which is not given here in this problem, x bar minus 2.086 times sample standard deviation divided by square root of 21. I don't know how to, do, to delete it, just a second. Okay. Let me delete it. Okay. So the confidence interval corresponding to 95% is going to be between x bar minus 2.086 times standard deviation over square root of 21, which is n, and the upper bound will be x bar plus 2.086 times s over square root of 21. Okay, as simple as that. Now let's look at another example. So large sample confidence interval. So we have some x which is which has finite mean and finite variance. We don't know the distribution of x. Okay, obviously we have to use central limit theorem. And what else? We, we don't really know the, um, so neither variance nor mean is known. And we have a sample. We need to construct an approximate 95%. You see, an approximate means that, uh, you, you see, we have to use the central limit theorem. Here, another indication of the usage of central limit theorem is that we don't know the distribution the exact distribution is unknown. So it indicates, it points, uh, points to the fact that you have to use the CLT. And the, the, the interesting side of this is that here we don't even know the population standard deviation and rather estimate that using the sample standard deviation. So nothing changes, not too many things change here. You have to say that, let's remind the CLT. So CLT is telling you that if you have IID sample, then X bar N is going to be approximately normal with mean mu and with variance. Here mean is, uh, so instead of mu, they use the notation theta and variance sigma square over N. And here the problem is that the sigma, instead of sigma square, we have S. So we don't know the population variance. Instead, we have sample variance, the one that we have estimated from uh, the sample data. So nothing is, is going to change. It is still going to approach the normal distribution with mean equal to theta and with variance equal to 
s squared over n. Now, if you want to make 95% confidence interval, we know that probability that probability of random variable, standard normal variable z falling within 2.5 and 97.5 quantiles is equal to 0 0.95, right? And we already know the formula. I don't, I don't need to elaborate on this fact, but I know that confidence interval, given this normality, at least asymptotic normality, 95% confidence interval in this case is going to be this, x bar plus uh, x bar minus the z quantile corresponding to 2.5%, which is 1.96 times s, which is the sample variance, the sample standard deviation, divided by square root of n. Let me see the n here. n is equal to n is not given. So if it's not given, then we cannot say anything. And the upper bound will be x bar plus 1.96 times s over square root of n. As simple as that. Okay. Now the next question is what? The next question is asks whether we can we can apply the same confidence interval to example two. I mean, yes, obviously we can apply. Why not? As long as it is an approximate thing, we can do that, obviously. But here, I believe we had the exact confidence interval. So when we have exact confidence interval, you don't really go for an approximate one, but nothing prevents us from applying this confidence interval, the formula, I mean, to this point, to, to this problem, because CLT is kind of CLT is kind of universal. It, it is it can be applied without strong assumptions. Example four: We have normally distributed random variable x. Theta is not known. Okay, we have to construct 95% confidence interval for theta now. Be careful because here we are constructing confidence interval for theta, which is uh, the variance of normal distribution. So here we have to use one theorem. Just a second. This theorem should be used in this case if you want to bound the unknown and constant population variance, okay? So now let's do that. Let's spend a little while to elaborate on that. So if you, okay, if you know that X is normal, that means zero. Um, actually it's, yes, it's X. and with variance equal to theta. And I know that, based on the theorem I have mentioned, n minus one times s square over sigma square is gonna be chi squared distributed with n minus one degrees of freedom. Here we don't have information about, uh, we have information about n only, and we know that we have to build 95% confidence interval. Just a second, okay, never mind, I'll write it here. X is normal, which means zero with variance theta. And we know that N, minus, N is equal to 21. So also I know that N minus one times S square over sigma square, which is true variance, is gonna be chi square distributed with N minus one degrees of freedom, right? Now I'm searching for this thing, I'm searching for probability that, I'm searching for chi-square 
quantile corresponding to 0 0.025 and I have n equal to 21 so it is 20 times s square over sigma square um, so instead of sigma square we have theta so this is this is sigma square is denoted by theta in this in this problem so let's be consistent okay and that is less than chi square 0 0.975 so this is what i want to do i'm i'm trying to to come up with a boundary for theta but i know that this guy is chi square with n minus uh, with, with 20 degrees of freedom i easily i can easily find this boundaries for this guy for this random variable chi square random variable with 20 degrees of freedom i can easily find this interval and this interval from the table and i have to make sure that this is equal to like five percent so it's kind of easy let's look at the table so the table is here So the degrees of freedom is equal to 20. And I'm searching for 975. It corresponds to this value. And the next value is here they kind of reversed the these two things. The so what I wrote as chi square 0 0.025 corresponds to 0 0.975 in this example. So one is 9.5, the next one is 34. You see, the intersection of 20 degrees of freedom with 2.5 and 975. Those guys correspond to what? Those guys correspond to nine point five and thirty four. Okay, let's let's put it let's keep it as nine point five and thirty four. Okay. And let me delete it. No, I don't need it anymore. Okay. I'll just keep it small. Okay, so I know that this guy is 9.5 and this guy is 34 approximately, right? And But the idea is not to come up with these boundaries, but we want to, the, the whole purpose of this is to leave theta alone in the center. And it turns out that we can do that easily. Just multiply, I mean, just divide both sides by 20, 20 times S squared. So you're going to get probability. So probability that, so I'm, I'm just replacing it with 9.5. Let me replace it. So we got 9.5 here and 34 here. 34. And this is just the random variable itself. Cool. So we can say that 9.5 divided by 20 times S square is less than 1 over theta and less than 34 times uh, 30, 34 divided by 20 times s square and that is equal to 0 0.95 and we can also reverse it we can say that probability i mean just swap the place of numerator and denominator we can say that um, 
theta is going to be less than 20 s 20 times s squared over 9.5 and that is going to be greater than theta is going to be greater than 20 s square over 34 and that is still equal to 0.95 percent okay so this is how we bounded it so we can say that we can basically write that confidence interval corresponding to 95 percent is equal to 20 s square over 34 this is the lower bound and the upper bound is 20 s square over 9.5 okay as simple as that now let's look